You know what it means to be sent to do a particular task, don't you? If you work in a warehouse, you might be sent by the boss or by orders that come in to go to a certain section of the warehouse to pick up a particular skid with items that fulfill that order. If you work for someone who lays carpet or tile and the client that pays for the job, you are on requests a certain kind of carpet or tile, you pick up what the customer has ordered, then you go to the job site and put down the carpet or tile so that it looks like the customer envisioned for their house or their business. Even if you are a teen and your mom needs a particular item to make for dinner, she might send you to the grocery store to buy the grocery items that she needs to make that dinner. We all understand the concept of being sent to fulfill the wishes of someone who is an authority over us, a boss, a parent, or as we will see today in our study, God the Father. In today's study of John 17, verses 6 through 19, which continues the Lord's Prayer on behalf of His disciples, Jesus will introduce two concepts. First, the idea of being sent to complete a task. Jesus Himself had been sent into the world by His Heavenly Father to gather disciples and teach them the concepts that they would need to fulfill their personal mission. Jesus Himself would complete His own heavenly mission by gathering those disciples, teaching them, doing great miracles, and demonstrate how to love others unconditionally. His mission would also include offering himself as an eternal sacrifice on the behalf of sinful men and women. Then in today's study, we will see how he sends those who have accepted his invitation to be on his team back into the world to share the gospel message of love with others. The second concept Jesus will highlight is the idea of sanctifying the ones who are on mission. To be sanctified simply means being set apart for a special work. Jesus has been sanctified for his mission to the people of the world. We too, as his followers, are set apart or sanctified to be gospel messengers to a lost and dying world. Let's now look at Jesus' prayer for his disciples in John 17, beginning at verse 6. I've revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, because I've given them the words you gave me. They've received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost, except the son of destruction so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that you may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them, so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Let's pray now before we continue. Father, as we look at Jesus' prayer for his disciples, we ask that you would help us to see that we are the ones that are sent to deliver a message of hope, the gospel message, to people who don't know, to people who need to know that there is a God who loves them and has a plan for their lives. Lord, we pray that you will also sanctify us or set us apart for doing that mission on your behalf. We need you, Lord, to be the one to send us into the world to, to share that good news with others. Now help us understand what you want to teach us through this message today. For these things I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus begins at verse 6 by indicating that he has revealed the Father's name to those who have been given him. 
We understand that those given to Jesus are the disciples who can be considered the 12 minus one since Judas Iscariot will be removed from the disciples' band due to his unbelief. Judas was identified by John as the one who was dishonest with the money he, admi he administered for the 12. In a sense, however, those who are Jesus' disciples may also include those who believed in him and trusted in him, both while he was living on earth and in the millennia following his ascension to heaven. The idea of revealing the Father's name seems like a simple thing. He is God, the Father, God the creator of all, God who resides in heaven. But in the Bible, one's name revealed one's strength, one's purpose. Proverbs 18 verse 10 proclaims, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are protected. We need to understand that the name of God is disclosed to people only when he desires it. God's name reveals his relationship to his people and is also key to his character. In verses 6 through 8, Jesus continually re refers to the word or words that the Father has entrusted to him to teach his disciples. Words represent all of God's message from the Bible that Jesus has been sharing with his disciples. Love one another as I've loved you. Worship God with all your mind, soul, and strength. Think of others before you think of yourself. Eternal life is given to those who believe the word of God. John also identified Jesus himself as the word. Now Jesus reflects that the believers have kept your word. Jesus has modeled his teaching on the words you gave me, again referring to the Father who has been the source of the master's earthly teaching. These very imperfect disciples were lifted up as followers of Jesus' teaching, yet we know that they often fail to measure up to Jesus' high standards of conduct. Even so, Jesus knew the hearts of his disciples, and that's why he prayed for them so fervently. In verses 9 and 10, Jesus continues by talking about ownership. God has given to the Son these disciples. Yet Jesus acknowledges that everything he has, including these followers, also belong to the Father, as he proclaims in verse 10, everything I have is yours. But Jesus recognizes this as a joint ownership, for he also says, and everything you have is mine. There is a unity of purpose in all that the Father and Son do. They are united in their desire to provide a way of salvation for all of humanity. They are united in their desire to send out representatives on their behalf who share the gospel with those who have not yet heard. Jesus even acknowledges that he is glorified in them. Imagine that. These human representatives of God will soon desert the Son during his crucifixion. They will fuss and feud about whether people need to become Jewish before they can become proper followers of Christ. Yet these disciples are acknowledged as ones who give glory to God through their ties to the Son as his followers. In verses 11 through 13, Jesus acknowledges that while he is getting ready to return to heaven, he is leaving his disciples on earth to continue sharing the gospel message to a hostile word, world, a world that would rather harass them and even snuff them out rather than listen to what they had to say. Because of this danger to the gospel remnant, Jesus prays to the Father for his protection over them. In verse 12, Jesus said that he had protected all those whom the Father had granted to be his, to follow, to be his followers, and he was able to keep them safe, all except the one called literally the son of destruction or the son of perdition. John has been keeping track of Judas Iscariot throughout, throughout his gospel. He records Jesus' words in John 6, verse 70. Jesus replied to them, Didn't I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. In John 12, 6, John identified Judas as the keeper of the money bag, who was more interested in taking out a little for himself from time to time than providing for the needs of the group. So Judas complained when Mary wasted expensive perfume to anoint the Lord's feet. John implies that he wasn't so much interested in preserving the group's funds as keeping plenty on hand so he could take out a little with no one noticing. Jesus 
in admitting that he couldn't exert complete control over his followers, acknowledged that each of them had the freedom to go his own way if they so desired, and Judas was permitted to make his own decision about his eternal destiny. Notice in verse 13 that even though Jesus was getting ready to return to heaven, the reason for going was so that his disciples, his true followers, would experience his joy completed in them. Crucifixion was waiting for Jesus just around the corner. And this would be a traumatic time for his followers as well. Yet he could speak about joy being fulfilled in his followers' lives. We must understand that this joy as resulting from Jesus completing the work that he had been sent to do on the earth, rather than just a momentary happy happiness. Now, the glory that he would receive in completing that work would reflect back to the Father, but also to his disciples as participants in God's holy plan for bringing the gospel message to all people. Jesus continues in verses 14 through 16 by praying to the Father that he would protect his disciples, the one carrying God's word of hope to the world from the evil one. We understand that this is Satan, the one who has opposed God's plan for the world from the beginning. We know from the stories told in the Bible that these disciples would be harassed, persecuted, and even sometimes killed for being bearers of God's word. Even though their lives may not be preserved, Jesus was praying for the continuing faithfulness of his followers as they persisted in sharing the good news of the gospel to a lost and dying world, even in the face of persecution and death. In verse 16, Jesus recognized that his followers were not of this world, just as he himself was not of this world. How are we to, are we to understand this designation, since we know that the disciples of Jesus were definitely human beings born here on earth? Being of the world denotes someone who adheres to the common mindset of the world. Live for yourself. Grab all you can while you can. Put in your allegiance to the ones who hold power in the world. The disciples were part of a limited group who appeared to have little power or influence in the world. That is, until one considers the power source behind the little group, God Almighty. In verses 17 through 19, Jesus introduces two important words into his prayer, sanctify and truth. Sanctify them by the truth. I sanctify myself for them, so that they may be sanctified by the truth. Remember, as I said earlier, that sanctify simply means to set apart for a special work. On the job, you may know as someone who does really well at a certain task. So you are always called upon by the boss to do that task. In other words, you are set aside for that task. Although the setting aside of which Jesus speaks is a special designation. When we ordain a pastor or a deacon to their office in the church, they are given a special service to denote that the church recognizes them as someone who will give themselves wholeheartedly to that work. When Jesus asks his Father to sanctify his disciples by the truth, he's asking the Father to designate those who have dedicated their lives to following God's will in their life to special service. In verse 19, Jesus prayed that he might sanctify himself for them. That is, he set aside himself. Or we might say that Jesus dedicated himself to fulfilling God's plan for his life. He did this so that through the truth of God's word, God's plan of sacrificing his son for the benefit of all mankind might be realized. This is the truth of the gospel. One gospel commentator has compared the witness of believers as a kind of infiltration into a hostile environment to conduct a special mission. Believers might be compared to army rangers or navy seals who have undergone extreme mental and physical tests to be worthy of carrying out difficult assignments behind enemy lines. We who have trusted God with our very lives have also prepared our minds and hearts through a lifetime of Bible study, worship, and practice in going behind enemy lines, that is, into the world where the gospel is not well known or even recognized in order to carry out the mission of sharing God's truth with a wary world to those who may not care to hear God's message for them. 
In doing so, we identify ourselves as gospel operations specialists who have prepared our whole lives to be on mission with God and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the lost and dying world. One of the things we have realized as we have studied Jesus' prayer for his disciples is that those who sincerely follow Christ to carry out God's witness to the world must maintain a high degree of trust in the Lord and to the God who sends us into the world. Let me share several principles that highlight this issue of trust as we carry out the mission of God in the world. First, we who follow Jesus can trust him with our lives because we recognize the Father has sent Jesus into the world to save the world. This takes faith. Believers in Jesus, his followers, have developed their faith through learning the basics of the gospel message. God the Father desired to provide a way of eternal life in heaven by sending his Son to die in our place as a sacrifice for our sins. When we wholeheartedly embrace the gospel, then we obtain faith sufficient to put ourselves in the, in the way of Satan's plans to derail the Father's witness in the world. Second, because we trust in God's promise to us through his word, we receive protection from Satan who tests us through personal affliction. Jesus prayed this very thing for those who would be his gospel messengers. He knew that Satan would do his best to knock us off track. He would send people to harass us because they didn't like our message of exclusiveness. They would rather let everyone be able to just do their own thing and live for themselves. But this would be contrary to God's plan for us to love one another and place others' needs above our own. Third, we will experience joy when we trust God through the truth of his word. Joy is a curious word to express when we are being tested and tried by Satan. Yet this is what Jesus prayed for in his followers' lives. He wanted us to have joy, and not just a superficial kind of joy. He wanted us to experience joy that was profound and deep, a joy that would last through all of our lives as we faithfully served him. As we acknowledge, however, the way we experience God's joy is by instilling the truth of God's word into our very being. This is why we read God's word, study it, and apply it into our daily lives. We experience true godly joy by being obedient to the word and the truth we find therein. Now, have you experienced this kind of joy in your life? Have you believed the truth of the gospel or are you just half-hearted in the exercise of faith in your daily life? Have you demonstrated in your life that you are a true follower of Christ? If not, this may be the day when you realize your lack of commitment and you decide to give yourself fully to the plan God has 